but presents a reality concerning that relationship. Constant placation of previous aesthetics consumes present resources to the extent that as the needs and desires of the present aesthetic make themselves felt, the resources have been exhausted. The artist's reality is no different than any other reality. It is the content that gives the perceptions and observations of an artist within the presentation of art a use factor within the society. The acceptance of the need for this distancing by a society, in fact the need itself by a society for its art to function, has led to the misconception that art and artists are apart from society unless they do not function as artists. few material relationships of human beings to objects that at various some stages have not required various some form of human being to human being relationship. The utilization of media presents these various relationships at the moment of the presentation of what in essence is a material relationship. Utilization of media as both presentation and representation seems to require no justification other than the presentation itself. Tobias Berger, I'm the director of, of Parasite Art Space. Um, thanks everybody for coming to that lecture by Lawrence Wiener. Um, first of all, we have to, or I have to thank, um, besides Lawrence, um, the art school or the Hong Kong art school um, for organizing the lecture here in the Hopewell Center, especially Pamela, not only for organizing that, but also for helping us bring a lot of people together and bringing a lot of people here. Um, also, um, to uh, thank for that exhibition, Christie's, which helped us to bring Lawrence over as well as the uh, um, Asian Count, um, Cultural Council with Michelle, um, who also were very generous for that great occasion. Um, having that here and having Lawrence here is not only the, not, not only, um, the talk and the, the exhibition, but it basically started with the invite you hopefully all got in the mail, more or less um, in a very nice form. If you don't, there are still some left here. Um, but also we're going to make a, a nice little project at the Star Ferry with some lifesavers and um, we're also going to put some of the works in public swimming pools. So the whole, the whole being here and the whole artwork we are going to do is in Parasite is a talk but it's a much, much um, larger event. Um, for me having Lawrence here in Hong Kong is basically an absolutely dream come true. I admire his work since um, very, very young and actually and 
this is one of the funny coincidences, um, Pamela will talk later about that house, but I stayed in that house and that is one of the most, for me, one of the most important artworks, which is a very personal experience, but I think Pamela will um, talk about that um, later. Um, for me, and every artwork and every talk as well we put into the world is going to change our way of perceiving things. And I hope that this talk will actually do the same, and I'm sure about that, that we will have new ideas, different ideas when we come out here. And that is why I also invited Lawrence, because Lawrence for me is one of the artists that is one of the most innovative artists, but also who opened up the art world and opened up art immensely for everybody um, since the 1960s with a very innovative pra practice, which but also makes sense to have here in Hong Kong because Hong Kong at the moment, and especially Parasite, we are talking about different art practices, different ways of communicating art and working with art, and um, I'm very happy that Lawrence is here tonight to talk about his, pract his practice. It is really how he writes in that, in, on that post and in that exhibition about either put aside or put away, to decide, to make that decision, but to reach for the start, and that's what we all hopefully try to do and um, are working for. Um, before I um, give over to Pamela, um, I just want to make a few announcements um, what's happening besides the opening of the exhibition, which is on Thursday from 6.30 at Parasite. I hope you all come and you're all welcome to come. We have next week, besides a wonderful artwork, we will have um, Nikolaus Schaffhausen in town. He's the um, director of the Kunsthalle, which is called Witte de Witt in Holland, but he's also the director of the German Pavilion um, in Venice this year. We are very happy to have him. Um, this talk will be at the Goethe Institute, also it's going to be very interesting. And also, um, Parasite, we will start something like a curatorial program as well. Um, if you have, want more information about that, um, let us know. Um, I, as I said, I'm happy that Lawrence is here. I'm very happy that he does the lecture because we always think, oh, artists, it's so easy to talk. They just talk about their practice and so on. But artists are actually not there to do talk. Artists are there to do art. And I'm always very thankful if I can kind of ask an artist and he accepts to give a talk, especially here in Hong Kong. And um, thank you, Lawrence, for agreeing to talk. I know it's not... We haven't, we haven't not, gotten through it yet. Oh, yeah, we haven't gotten through <laughs> But we haven't gotten through me yet. And um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pamela, for having us here, and um, thanks everybody for coming in for that lecture. Good evening, everyone, too, from us at the Hong Kong Art School. Uh, on behalf of our academic head, uh, Dr. Ho Su Ki, and myself, Pamela Kemba, we'd like to welcome all of you tonight. Um, before uh, Lawrence, Lawrence's uh, arrival, I was trying I was trying very, very hard to think how I could actually uh, introduce him because obviously so much has been written about, uh, so much has been written about him, and so much has been stated about him through his own work. But what I found really fascinating, uh, and this connection with Tobias uh, Lawrence, myself, and uh, a man called Stephen Vincent, who lives in San Francisco, but actually has been going to New York for the past 20 years, and he's been photographing the front of this house. Um, he's intrigued to go, he doesn't know why he's drawn back to this place. He keeps looking over and over at the words and finds sometimes the syntax, the language, very complex, wondering what does it relate to? Does it relate to the drain pipes um, on the side? Does it relate to the fact that it was um, belonged to the founder of uh, the Fluxus Movement, John Hendricks? Um, he's been pondering this uh, for a number of years. Um, and I just happened across this image when I was uh, Googling a search for Lawrence to find out a little bit more about him. Um, what was interesting was uh, Stephen Vincent um, began to talk about this work to his 91-year-old mother. And um, he said, um, you know, sometimes this kind of works like this you really uh, can't really describe. Uh, he said it's a bit like reading a Chinese poem. Uh, it's very simple, but at the same time it's very meaningful. And he, he read out a poem to his grandmother, uh, sorry, his mother, and um, his mother at the end of the poem, the Chinese poem, said, that's very profound, very profound. And Stephen said, what do you mean by profound? And he's, sorry, I just have to say the words exactly as she said it. Uh, okay, well, it's more than profound, let's say it's potent, okay? Um, so what does potent mean? Well, it's strong. Well, what do you mean by strong? Well, nothing interferes with it. That's her response to this Chinese poem. 
and Stephen thought about that in terms of what he felt this particular work means for him. And he says that even though I stumbled across it, what makes it work is the elements that enrich a critical enterprise and ideally the deepened appreciation of a particular work. Something about my first and continued apprehension of this Lawrence Wiener work, even as its typeface begins to deteriorate, and the fact that my 90-year-old mother makes such simply profound comments as nothing interferes with it. Um, I actually Googled him and said, I'm going to mention it tonight in my talk with Lawrence, and he said, please ask him if he can please come back to me at some point in the future, because I'd really love to talk to him more. So I think across the miles and the fact that until tonight, Tobias had absolutely no idea I was going to show this image, and I had no idea he lived in this house, and that we are all here together, and Lawrence, his words are on the wall. So please welcome Lawrence Lina. Essentially, would like to 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 say, uh, art is not profound, <laughs> and the idea of art being untouchable, uh, that's not its purpose. Its purpose really is to get in the way. Uh, human beings make art for other human beings, and all art essentially is an object. Uh, it has nothing to do with its form. Uh, my use of language. I must say, has been blown totally out of proportion. Uh, if I am any good as the artist that I tried to become when I was becoming an artist, it's because the work has entered into the society and is useful for people to build a logic structure from. All art presents a logic structure, whether it's in any form that it takes. Those logic structures are used by people to find their own place in the world. I am a little perplexed today to be doing this. I don't lecture and I, I, I've never taught. Uh, I've done some seminars when I was broke. And, uh, I, I don't think that's even, uh, to tell you the truth, that wasn't said to be amusing. Uh, teaching is, is an extremely honorable profession, but it carries with it a certain authority. And my choice to not teach was nothing against the academy because I realized this morning on the radio when they were, were interviewing me, they asked if the luck that I had, because I, I grew up in the South Bronx, which is sort of a not nice place. And uh, if it hadn't been for my falling by luck or what into a school structure, uh, I would never have even known that art existed. So it's not about my rejection of the academy, it's the fact that once you enter the academy, the requirement is, is that the teacher has a form of authority. Often in our world, uh, misplaced and often in our world undeserved, but it's better that the student and the child sees this as an authority and from that they can build something. I chose not to teach because I didn't want to join the establishment. And I had to make a decision because I'm a normal person like everybody else and I did want to have a child and all of that. The genteel poverty was probably the better way and it didn't even sound romantic in, in the 60s. Uh, I come out of the 50s and my choices to make art are really to put things in the way of other people that they stumble over, that they notice and from that they can build a structure. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions from anybody at any time about of uh, my past about the work that I've done, maybe a piece that they've seen that interested them, or maybe a structure, but I'm not here to explain it. I think art should be shown and art should be invariably placed without any explanation. Uh, my, my dream is to be able to make things that don't have instructions. Uh, the use of language was to take it away from the romanticism of the artist knows how to do that better when you realize you're talking about a piece of wood in relation to another piece of wood in relation to a human being. Once you've got that straight, it doesn't matter whether the wood was made in Japan, <coughs> sorry, it doesn't matter whether the wood was made in, in Northern Europe or whether it was made in Hong Kong. Uh, you have another kind of thing. I'd like to take it that the artist as a human being could be a romantic, 
but the position of being an artist and the idea of being an artist is not a romantic choice. It seems to be a necessity within our society. And my attraction to it was that with a very small footprint, you could fuck everything up. And I didn't realize that that's the only one nice thing for artists is when their work becomes a little bit uh, accepted and they're out in the world. I did a project in New York uh, with manual covers, which almost came about by chance, but once it did, surprisingly, the electric company that did the manual covers, the people that built the foundry things for all of these structures and sewers in the, in the city, became enthusiastic. And it was before Time Warner took over the local New York City television station which was cable, which meant you could say anything you wanted. There was no censorship on it at all. And somebody came to me and was interviewing me in front of the last of the vandal covers in this, this strap, which went from the Lower East Side, where I, it was my drinking route, went around McDougal Street, or around Washington Square, went to Union Square from Texas, Kansas City. It went basically the structure of my life as I was developing as a human being. And I'm. It ends, by the way, at the Greenwich Village Old People's Home, <laughs> which is about four blocks from where I ended up living anyhow at this point. And they looked and they said, listen, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I know what you do. And I said, that's nice. It's just a reporter. And he said, uh, and I know your whole background because I was involved in civil rights in the city and involved in the South. And he said, and you know, you're a very violent person. You're a very aggressive person. And this doesn't seem aggressive. And I stood there and I never thought about me being as an aggressive person and realized that it wasn't aggressive, but the whole point was I did not want to take people on their way to work and fuck up their day. I wanted to fuck up their whole life. <laughs> and the way to do that is to take sculpture, to take things and to place them within a context that when they see it, is in a gallery, in a public space, any place else, that logic structure requires acceptance. And once you do, you no longer can go back the way that you were before. And I think all artists, in the end, try to do that. They try to present not their own world, not a world that you can aspire to. They just try to present a material reality that reality carries with it a logic structure. And if you are lucky and you get it right, that logic structure doesn't really allow anybody any longer to accept that art and follow a pattern that would allow sexism, racism, fascism, and those things because they won't make any sense anymore. And I prefer to talk about what my interests are now rather than history, but as I said, I'm really more than happy to answer questions if I remember, but don't ask me dates. Uh, I date everything by occurrences. I, it's when, you know, I'm very, really very serious when you were in love with so-and-so, but you don't know the date, date. <laughs> and then you begin to take it for granted that everybody knows when your daughter was born, but they don't. <laughs> And uh, I don't know how one opens this up and moves it along that it moves. I also brought something with me that if it, I did a cartoon a couple of years ago, I've been doing a set of cartoons for children. Uh, not child, child, I'm doing a book for Steidl and I've done a child's book recently in San Antonio, English and Spanish. And I've done the, the, uh, from the educational system in France, a book about the placement of objects as existential choices. But these cartoons were dealing with uh, questions that people did not realize 12-year-olds thought about and 10-year-olds thought about, which were non-existential questions. They're materialist questions. And it runs for about 16 minutes or so, and I think somewhere along the way, if you indulge me, I'd like to show it, because it's not something that's usually invited to a place like Hong Kong. I don't know where to go from here. My interests right now are that from the work that I've made and from the work that other people have made that I've, I've learned from and, and come from, there seems to be a misunderstanding about what art is. And art seems to be accepting a Heisenberg 
concept of chaos theory, which in fact is pre-Galilean. If you touch it, you control it, you change it, it never will be the same. But the world does not revolve around us. We revolve around the sun, and there's really nothing wrong with it. And I've been trying to build an aesthetic for the last 10 or 15 years that is post-Galilean, that accepts the fact that art is an integral part of each culture, but there is no hierarchy between cultures. At given times, some cultures are more useful for whatever ends you want than other cultures. But it's not because they're better or they're worse. They either work or they don't work. My coming to making sculpture was a realization that if you can imbue a piece of stone and imbue a person looking at that piece of stone with a dignity, that dignity carries over into an entire life form. And I think that that is, again, another universal of all artists, the aspiration is to help other people find a place in the sun. There's the classic little anecdote. No, I'm not good at anecdotes because art does not produce anecdotes. People do. And people make art, so we have little stories, but you don't get any real insights from it. The imbuing of dignity to things is, is pretty classic. Uh, it's Mies van der Rohe, when asked, how do you build a building? And his answer was, you carefully place one brick against another. And the way you make art is to take materials and try to figure out a way to present to other people what the relationships of those materials are. And in doing that, you can step aside from any metaphor. Art that carries a metaphor with it is telling somebody that they have to believe in your value structure before they can try and even think of using what you're presenting to them. If art does not carry with it a metaphor, if it is just a material reality, each human being in the world that comes across it can bring their needs and their expectations and their desires to that and use it to make a metaphor for themselves. And there is a difference between using something to make a metaphor and producing and showing a metaphor. Metaphors lock you into a value structure that you ostensibly are trying to change. And then you use this metaphor. I, I, I see art in a, in a very dramatic way. It's this thing that floats above this table. And in floating above this table, it doesn't fit any place. Nobody really quite knows what to do with it. It's not useless. That was a nonsense of, of post Greenbergian thinking. Uh, it's, it doesn't get used because you understand its, its basis and where it comes from. It gets used because at that particular moment it opens a door, it stops a draft, or it keeps the water from flowing in. And it keeps floating and floating. And the table is all the accomplishments of human beings and all of these things. Let's say it's just art that's there. It's all the accomplishments before you. And it, it, it's reflected in its glow, but it still can't find a damn place. The minute it does, it slowly settles down into this table and becomes art history. Now, art history is useful to understand where we came from, but it's not in any way useful to understand what to do now. And I think art is an active thing that's invariably looking for its place. And for me, I'm very proud of many of the works that I've made, and I'm very pleased, in fact, that they've helped other people find what they wanted to determine from their lives. But once it enters into the world, I don't know what to do with it anymore. And I see that half of the things that people, this piece is, 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 is an interesting piece because it's been shown in different places, and uh, Jeff Hendricks and Brian Buzak. Uh, Brian had become ill, and they had asked if I would do a work for them for their bread, uh, what was it called? God, Art for Bread, or something like that. I even forget the name of what it was for their, their situation. And the, we put the work up, and it was the first time in, the, in that part of the Lower West Village that they had a party any place with Kier. Nobody knew what Kier was. And I had, I had, I had a show in France and I became excited by Kier, so we put tables out on the street and we inaugurated the work. The work is all about sculpture. The work is all about the 
residues of things that are moved from one place to the other. And it is water spilled from source to use. It's not about anything. It is something. And art essentially is an object. We come from a historical time where people were trying to change the world, which they're supposed to, since it sort of sucks. But uh, working through that kind of situation, uh, they had developed this thing of, of saying that art was not an object. And yet they were asking people to use it. They were asking people to pay attention to it. Of course it's an object. And putting 40 pieces of paper on the wall saying this is not an object is ludicrous because it takes away the dignity of the 40 pieces of paper. Not even necessarily what's on them. 40 pieces of paper are 40 pieces of paper. And I've been finding that my praxis more and more is becoming uh, related to attempting to just put all of those things aside, not questioning them, just making them no longer what in English is called obviating. By virtue of its existence, certain other things exist, but they no longer have any use and no longer any power. And I, this work, I, I don't know what to say about it. I almost hope sometimes when I do do a little public performance or, or, or put yourself in front of people, that they use it as an experience. I, I'm an artist who's been showing since 1960. Uh, I'm used to people not liking what I do, and I'm used to people liking it. I'm good at questions, and if anybody here would like to move the conversations in any direction that they'd like to see, I'd be more than happy to do it. I'm saying that it's almost like a plea. <laughs> I have no soap to sell. I cannot tell you how to make art. I, I can tell you what informs my attempt at, at, at building a praxis of making art. The use of language was a choice that turned out to be highly fruitful for me. It allowed me then to build my own mise-en-scene, my own stage sets. I could make movies, I could put them in them, I believe in books. I could put them in books, I could participate in exhibitions with my colleagues by virtue of, the lang of using language to present sculpture. And it's just to present it. Because when, you, when I fill out a loan form for a museum, it always says language plus the materials referred to. It is steel and stone and wood and spit and sweat. And the sweat is not referring to me, sweat is as well a material. There's a piece in Paris that was, that was built into, this, into the structure of the sidewalk that's all about nickel, sweat, and tears. And sweat is not as saline as tears. But nickel is a rather interesting thing because any compound, anything that mixes materials together, it takes them out of an alchemical and it takes them out of any kind of uh, mystical sense. Oh, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> Yes. I was wondering, you, you talked about how art should be material, and how material and not be a few of metaphors. But isn't it true that every person has a value structure within themselves? How can they divorce themselves from that when they're creating a piece? How can the piece be disconnected from their own value structure? I don't think you have to disconnect it, and there, there is an anecdote that might even explain it better than my own personal thing. It's Jean-Paul Sartre, at some given moment, was selling during rather difficult times in, in France, selling Humanité, which was a leftist newspaper in the street. And his colleagues came to him, and he was no longer young, and said, Jean-Paul, you can't do this. This is ridiculous. You are the most famous literature. You've even turned down the Nobel Prize. Uh, you can't be selling this newspaper. And he looked at them and said, Aha, look at me. I'm looking at you. From 7 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock every day, I'm working on my Flaubert book. And perhaps I am a great literateur. After 12 o'clock, I'm just a citizen of France. And this is the way it goes. And that's where your structure comes out. When, when your anger with a culture, for me at least, I can't tell anybody else what to do, when your anger with a culture for its indignities, the indignities it, it imposes on people, when you're angry with a culture because it's not quite right, it's not working, what you do is you present your value structure, but in such a manner 
that nobody has to know who you are, what you are, or what you think. And if they accept what they see, it changes their logic pattern in such a way that it brings it closer to what your moral and your feelings are. Even using language, which I see as rather objective, I still have to deal with typefaces. And I, I found myself as, as a young artist hating Helvetica and what it stood for. And not being in a position to, to force people to do things, I had to find a typeface. And I found this Franklin Gothic extra condensed. This is really an answer to your question. And it, it didn't, it was a sans serif, it didn't carry with it any authority, but I thought it was really rather elegant. After 15 or 20 years of using it, I began to realize that when people saw that typeface, that they were thinking it was something to do with me. Didn't, I, I went in a store and I bought the letter set, the letter press. So I found another typeface and I bought it uh, on the, on, from a type fund place. And that began to do, so I, began, I drew my own typeface. There's just no way that you can do it because you develop. When people talk about their inner core, if you think that your art is going to be changing the people around you, better also believe that it's going to be changing you. So carrying with that, but when you make a work of art that does not give anybody tools to use, but tells them there's an indignity going on, which is the highest form of journalism, who wants yesterday's newspapers? What good is it? What is your child when they look at a work of art have to have to know your anger and your 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 feelings about indignity? They don't have to know that you want them to have a logic structure that does not even allow them to think of imposing that indignity on another person or on another structure. That's a long answer. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, romanticism is a funny thing. The artist is looked at as romantic. I never saw the artist as an anti-hero or a hero. It's one of the questions that always bothers me. Uh, I was very involved with the central uh, Franco-American existential thought when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and it probably still carries over now that I'm 65. But there's one thing I didn't get in Breathless, in Abu Tasufla, in all of the places that you see this thing, in Camus, in, uh, in, the, in the Adventures of Love, Cardi. Where did this nonsense come about that an existential gesture required killing a stranger? Why is an existential gesture saying that you have a dignity that is not based upon <coughs> history? You have a dignity that is not based upon the cultural values you've been taught require Malevolence. It's cowardice. And I've been working with Luke Vizan, the poet, on a, on a book that we're working on called Bread Upon the Water, trying to figure out where this whole mess came about, that the only way that you can exclude yourself from, from the society is malevolence towards a stranger. It always has to be a stranger. And uh, I don't think it has to be a stranger, it could be yourself. Uh, that's where the work of Ginapani, the work of, you know, Kanchi worked itself in. I don't see it, I see myself as a very simple person, and as a very simple sculptor, literally just placing things out in the world that I do hope somebody trips over. Uh, and I mean that quite frankly. I don't know where one goes from all of this. As I said, I, I, I was confronted by the fact that I, I was working on an outreach program for a, a, an architectural firm, and they were looking for interns, and I would do the seminars and mix them together, and we talk about the essential basis of what sculpture is, what, uh, what architecture is. And I began to do this set of DVDs, because I was the movies that I make are quite rarefied and they're, they're, they're quite simple. But the DVDs began to be conversations that are going on. And I, if it is all possible, if you could just bear with me, I'd love to play the DVD and then have a conversation afterwards. Uh, I'm a lucky artist, I can be Google. So I don't have to, no, it's, I don't have a website. Uh, but uh, the work had entered into the culture in such a way that 
when somebody comes across something, it doesn't require an explanation. And yet, if they're curious about something else, they can find it and it, it's there. So if we could play that DVD.
and then relegate it to another gender. Dot, dot, dot. And then utilize as to another gender. And then unpend it as dot, dot, dot. And it's a done deal. Sink or swim. Dot, dot, dot. And then relegate it to another gender. Dot, dot, dot. And then utilize as to another gender. And then untend it as dot, dot, dot. And it's a done deal. Sink or swim.
to resemble another by the addition of a sufficient quantity of external qualities. Not make things different, just change them, or it. Primary attempt, secondary attempt, tertiary.
If structure isn't, oh, that's another conversation. No, Dave, I, I hope you're competent to deal with that. I don't know if I am, whether structure is an inherent value. I see structure as a material object. And as a material object, it becomes an object, an object, an objectified thing. Oh, there's a funny thing I, I've been, oh, thank you. I've been working on, on a, a series of work which simplified itself out with the work that was shown in, in, in a, uh, an exhibition in Iceland. And now, uh, much to my great pleasure, uh, is even being used as the title of an essay that Liam Gillick is writing about me for the uh, Whitney. And it was the objectification of desire. How do you objectify desire? All you have to do is change the the to an a. Uh, and you've objectified desire. And it becomes a sculpture of material. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. I, 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 I'm, it's a rare occasion when one gets to, to sort of like a captive audience and show them what you're, this is where my head is right now, where I'm trying desperately to figure out a way that the work that we've all made and we're still making fits into a context that can be seen by somebody without them knowing the history. And uh, making things for 10 year olds, 12 year olds, 13 year olds, uh, seemed like a good idea. And we premiered this in Venice. And uh, as you know, any kind of picture, any kind of movie is a very good thing for artists because no matter how open you are to the world, you're still essentially in some kind of um, isolated ivory tower situation. And you can't make a movie by yourself. You can't do any kind of media by yourself. So, and because of the economics, you essentially have to convince somebody that they should become involved. And in convincing them, you basically have to say something. <laughs> Are there any questions about any of the, the relationships of uh, a cartoon to a body of sculpture? Or the relationships of anything? Does anybody want to ask me anything while I'm here? Jane? Do you want to talk about your work at um, the Parasite? That's yes, very much. The, the reason that I brought this tape is that the work in Parasite is, is essentially a work that uh, is about sink or swim. That's why we have the, the illusion of that. We put the entire exhibition, which I really must say that this is sort of super, on a life preserver. We were able to build an installation, which I hope you'll, you'll be able to see, but the entire show itself is on a life preserver, which we're going to try to put into Pier 7, and we're going to distribute when the weather gets a little bit warmer at public pools and on the beaches to children, just on the simple little ones. We make the, these plastic things that can be given away, and these other things that will hang there, where people waiting for the ferry will look up and they'll have this idea of reaching for the stars, reaching for the moon, and reaching for the core. The work is based with, the, again, the objectification of what the reason we build sculptures for. And I know it sounds trite, but the idea of being able to think in terms of finding your own place in the sun by virtue of the objects around you is not a trite idea. It's the things that make Brancusi interesting. It's the thing that made all of the things that made us interesting in art uh, function and, and function in, in a different manner. I have a very funny little thing that we knocked together, and I will apologize for the, the quality of the photos, but we just scanned them off of uh, some photos, and it's called 21 Questions, and I see art is always a question. Art is not an answer. Art doesn't answer anything, but it does question something. And it's, all the, it's a series of work, and it's 21 photographs of work that are in public places that when come upon, the question is, do they function without a, an inherent history, or do they not? Would we kind of do that? It's silent, and it's just a, it's just a whole bunch of pictures. But uh, I apologize again for the quality, but there wasn't a lot of time to put it together.
you fulfilled your function as an artist. And hopefully the questions are to the point. I, can, I have very little more to say. <laughs> yes? Excuse me? Yes. But then um, your uh, invitation to uh, the show that you can do on Thursday. Yes. We have um, Chinese characters. Oh, Cantonese and Mandarin. That's right. Um, how at ease are you, my Chinese? How? How at ease are you in Chinese? Well, in, in Mandarin or Cantonese, not at all. I, I only speak six or seven languages, but uh, and four or five well. But uh, there's a limit to anybody's capabilities. I have to trust translators sometimes, and that's the way life is. But all the work that I've ever done has been designed to be able to be translated. There is no subtlety involved. It's not poetry. It's designed to be translated. It's just what it is in sculpture. So uh, when I worked on this project, uh, I had to rely upon the translations and an attempt to, to build a structure and to also design some kind of amenable typeface to myself. That's as close as you can get. Everybody can't do everything. Yes, but, but articulation, by the way, uh, uh, most artists have spent the majority of their career being told that what they're doing is absolute nonsense. After a while, you get reasonably articulate, explaining that it may not be good, but it's not foolish. But uh, when you're handling words, you're handling words, and you're handling words, and you're handling words, and then I, I, I trust that you can juggle with words, and, and with knowledge that only a first language speaker can handle language. If you're trying to, to talk about something that is not objective, yes. But when you're dealing with a piece of stone or a piece of this or something inside of something or outside of something, uh, it doesn't require a lot of subtlety. Remember, uh, well, you don't have to be really smart to be a good artist. You basically just have to be very honest. And you look at the honest, I, I mean that quite seriously. It's something that the few times that I end up in a, near an art school or so trying to explain that if the artists who they think are heroes from Warhol to this one to that one, they weren't particularly smart. They were intelligent enough to get through their day. But uh, it's not about smartness. It's about perception and maybe it's a little bit about generosity of trying to show the world what you've noticed and maybe a little bit of naivete. Thinking that what you've noticed is of some importance because it was to you. <laughs> I think it's a necessity for all of us in our lives every day. Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I. That's one. The recurrent uh, symbols like stars and arrows, as well as the recurrent motif of water. Water, water. Is that yes, good? That's water. <laughs> uh, I'm fascinated personally by water. I even choose, and I'm only, I don't need that thing. I even choose, and I'm only comfortable in, in water places. I'm even one of those people. That, that adores Paris, but I can't stay in Paris for longer than six or seven days working without trying to hustle somebody with a fast car to drive me to the ocean. And I take a walk, I have a coffee, and I go, why do we just turn it off? Take a walk and, and things. I find water one of the most basic materials that you could build sculpture from. And not because of its changeability, and not because it's, it's never the same, etc. But water itself, with its mass, is a form of mass. The use of uh, all of these symbols are, are means of communication. Dot, dot, dot is a basic filmmaker's thing. And then, and then, 
it, it's part of a, a film that I, w I made with Mark Ovenhaus years ago in the, in the 70s, where the basic question is, and then, and then, and I see the same for sculpture. The arrow is a vector anytime we place things, but you can go through and give names to any of this. Uh, in the end, it's, it's how it comes as, a, as an o'clock. Uh, a, a kind of a situation. I've been using this this form of uh, the ant antithesis of infinity, which is of course infinity. And an interesting thing happened. I was working on a public project and I was on some sort of round table talk for the television in a regional station in France. And one of the people said, but nobody will understand that. Meaning, we understand it, but nobody else will understand it. And their little son was standing there about 11 or 12, and the educational system is okay in France. And he said, Papa, Papa, uh, we use that in school. And he said, what is it called? And he said, we use a lot of things that don't have names yet. <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'm not doing that as artistic license. We use things that are universally acknowledged. They can go from, from the bush to a city, everybody knows how to use it and what it is, they think, and nobody knows what it's called. I, for years, using the ampersand, thought it was called the typewriter and. And to break things down in that, that kind of a structure, uh, it's interesting, but I don't know how important it is. No, art is a political statement, but I, I, most of life is a political statement. Uh, no sane person gets out of bed in the morning and goes to work unless they can make a political statement. Yes, I see what I'm doing, obviously. I, my major attempt, again, is to break down these hierarchies that we've been taught, either from materials, and it's not metaphorical, and it's not analogous. Break down the hierarchies between cultures and so-and-so. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's not because it's inferior. Yes, I see it. all the work that I do as political. That's why I made this DVD, and that's why I, I asked adults to sit and watch what I essentially made for, for children. Because it is political, and it doesn't have a double meaning. Yes? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the question or not, but it's come to my mind that um, how do you compare your work with Chinese culture? I know Jenny, I know Jenny since she was in the words, but uh, Jenny does something that I must honestly say I don't approve of. Jenny tells you what to do. Jenny tells you what's good and tells you how to do it. Who the hell is she to tell you what to do? And art is never supposed to tell people what to do. It's essentially a presentation, it's never an imposition. When art becomes an imposition, you're looking at something that has nothing to do with art, since art is an interactive thing. What you show in 1963 functions for a while, and it functions differently in 2007. That's my difference between Jenny and myself. So it was not a bad question. <laughs> it's something I'm very proud of. I, I make work that's an accomplished fact. It's always in, in a past perfect or in a subjunctive past. It's always in an, an already established fact. And nobody has to do anything other than use what it means. It's about meaning. It's not about telling or showing or anything else. It doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't have instructions. And the morality that comes about with this instructive art and this assertive art that tells you what to do, that means you carry with it all of the values that gave you the Second World War, Vietnam, Korean War, etc., etc. And if you don't want to accept them, why are you listening to these people? I don't know, but when I was watching the video recently, I felt like I was instructed. I was my vision is sort of shaped by the way you make your video. Oh, well, that's that's the reason we all make art. You make art to put things in a package that enters into somebody else's psyche and lifestyle. That's not telling them to do something. 
that's showing them something. And again, uh, the, the only reason we use virtuosity in work, like in Ed Rocher, is, a, is virtuos virtuosity in painting, is to entice you, to attract you, the same way that when you when you want to convince somebody of something, you go, you brush your teeth, you clean yourself up, you stand there. That's nothing wrong with that. That's present presentation. It's not an imposition. It doesn't say, if you don't believe me, you're foolish. If you don't believe me, you're this, you're that. That's fine. If it enticed you and it made you feel that you should be paying attention to what I had to say, bravo. <laughs> then I succeeded. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a nice person. I just don't. I, I don't I, I'm really quite serious. Uh, I didn't enter becoming an artist because I was a nice person. I entered becoming an artist, as most artists do, because I looked at the configuration of the way the world was looking at objects. My, my art really comes from being a slum kid and finding uh, National Geographic and beginning to realize that there were different value structures and cultures. And that if I could understand them, then I could be of some use to the society, and there is a difference between being a good person and being of some use. That's, I got, I got, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes? I only know your work from you know, the photographs, but um, whenever you see, you see photos of your work, it's always very well framed so that any other messages is out of the frame, really. Um, what do you think about? Do you work in a place like Hong Kong, where there's an overload of visual messages? I'm on my way to Seoul. For, uh, I've been invited to participate in a project for a permanent piece that's going to be put into almost a Ginza-like strip. Yeah, I do it all the time. It's just that you, those yeah, are not yeah. the photographs that you see. But uh, are you concerned that um, your message might not be as noticeable as the photographs No, not at all, because uh, it gets back at this, this is an anecdote. I do remember being in London in 1971 or so, making a show in a gallery that, in fact, didn't really exist. It was Jack Wendler Gallery. There were people like myself and Stanley Brown and I don't know what were showing there, people that nobody really was interested in. And I fly posted my the work all over London on hoardings with other things. And I figured, gee, I've been showing so much in Europe here, this is a language that is even a primary language of mine. I'm not going to misunderstand the guy. And I went into a bar, and I do this often and with taxis, with public things. They don't know who you are. And you say, well, what is that garbage? And the guy looked through the window of the pub. He said, oh, that's art. <laughs> <laughs> this is 1971. Black letters on a white poster. Okay, I looked at him and I said, uh, what do you mean that that's art? He said, oh, you know, these young artists, they don't have any place to show, so they put it up on boardings. I said, oh, you like this? And he said, I'm not interested in art. But he knew what it was. And I don't have to, uh, I'm not afraid of that. So what if somebody sees something, and then you're talking about the relationship of uh, brick to concrete and, and other things and materials, and they think it's an ad. What's wrong with that? They're getting the meaning of what you're saying, and that's the reason you put things in public places. Isn't there a danger that it will disappear by just being there for a while? Being an artist, there's a danger you're going to disappear every single morning, and it has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with the market. I don't mean that, that your work is no longer going to be functional within the structure. Yeah, there's a danger. It's, 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 it's a high-risk profession. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yes. I was just in Sao Paulo, and I was so pleased that the Sao Paulo Biennale 
somewhere in the cult in a feature film I had made in 73 or 72. And I realized that I had been doing that with an uh, analog camera, having the work on the wall or something. Just the camera passes you by, very much like a passerby in the street. And I don't see a problem with that. You know, people, people's eyes, are, they, they notice things. But uh, digital sorry, things, Lawrence, I don't know. I, Lawrence, sorry, we can't hear anything. Oh, I, I'm sorry. But, uh, I'm so pleased to, to be answering questions. No, no, it's not about the sound. It was that effect I was talking into the corner. <laughs> I, 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 my apologies. But uh, this idea of uh, digital changing things, I don't think it's about instant gratification. And uh, I don't think that uh, this overwhelming overload of information is, is really any different than the advent of television into people's lives, the advent of radio into people's lives. Uh, in the end, it's going to be the substance of what's being presented within the digital format that makes the difference. And people will remember things. It, it doesn't have to be shoved down people's throats and constantly reiterated. But remember that most art things uh, are of no use to a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to question what their relationship to the world is. And they find art, and they do find art at strange times in their life. I know as a person myself, I found it as a kid when I thought I had made the right choices, and I knew I was doing the right thing, and I was, I was organizing, I was this, and I was a young kid. And something happened with uh, a Giacometti, which was the palace at 4 a.m. in the morning, when I realized that there was a whole thing. And it was just by accident I was in the Museum of Modern Art. They sent out cards to all of these slum schools to get in for free. And I had discovered that, to be perfectly frank, it was much nicer to cruise in the Museum of Modern Art for girls because not only did you do your adolescent thing of having the, getting sex, but you could also talk to them about something when you were finished. <laughs> so I began to look around. And no, I'm not kidding. I, I, it sounds cute, but it's, it's really the truth. And you, you enter into things by accident. And I saw this Giacometti that was in the Museum of Modern Art just sitting there. And because of that, and I looked at the Pollock, and I began to see the Pollock as some kind of a star map in relationship to the materiality of the paint. And I had been doing manual labor as a kid, well, most since I'd been 12 on the docks and all. This all made a lot of sense to me. And from that, I went and searched out the bars where these people who called themselves artists were. And New York in those days was not a uh, it was not a Protestant city, and you could start drinking in bars when you were 12 or 13 if you were tall enough and you were quiet enough. And I found these people, and they, they, that would became the world that I wanted to enter into, and I realized I had, I had to do something in order to be there. And that, that's, so I'm not worried about it. You are. <laughs> no, it's a concern, but I, I don't think it's a major concern. And, and maybe the concept of, of how much you have to look at something to understand it has changed. Maybe we're becoming quicker readers. I don't, I don't mean by language. I mean, maybe you can do a quicker read when you see something, and you can go back to it. There is an advantage to the digital. You can, you can see the movie again. That's an advantage, that's something. So. Yes. How would you say um, that the, the quality of humor plays, uh, what sort of significance does it have in your work? Obviously, a lot of the work that you do has a sort of edge to it. Well, I never would say if you can't do anything, get the fuck out of my house. And the gentleman asked if uh, what humor had to do with anything. I, I don't know. I when you know, I make jokes sometimes. Yes, sometimes a joke is the most pointed way of uh, of getting through it. That, that those anti-racist broadcasts I was doing in France and in, in northern Italy and in Austria, they're jokes. Some of them, you know, like. What do you call this? In, what do you call this influx? And people say it's the plague. It's this. It's that. And then somehow or other you bring it around and you say, Oh, you mean it's like a, a small rock concert? You're talking about 90,000 people. Uh, that's funny. 
and it gets its point across. Yes, I use jokes, and in the work itself, I don't use jokes. It's just that some natural phenomena are funny. Remember the world, I, we did this wonderful project, uh, three old fart artists, uh, Julio Sarmento, John Baldessari, and myself, did something called Thrift, uh, where John was doing slapstick, and I was doing another aspect of a kind of a slapstick. And we were using humor as a means of dealing with this multiple perceptions for a projection. But it's so rare that you even start off using humor, it's just some things are funny. Have you used the human body as a palette? As a palette? You mean as an Eve Klein thing? No, I make movies and, and I do performances, so I ask people sometimes to do things. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm using human beings to present a mise-en-scene, a form, a, a, a kind of an arrangement. But as a palette, I, other people have put, people who, who have work of mine have had them tattooed on them. Uh, I couldn't, I mean, I like tattoos, I have tattoos, my, my lover has tattoos, my daughter has tattoos, uh, that's not the point, I couldn't do that to somebody, I don't see art as, I'm not so sure of the work that I make that it should be that permanent, but other people have done it and I've been willing to design the tattoo for them, but that's their choice, so I wouldn't, an Eve Klein thing, you know, no, I haven't, but give it time, you never know. <laughs> Well, I think that's it. Yeah, I'd high risk performance. Yeah. Last one. I can see you uh, is visited in many places in the world. Yes. And uh, do you have any? Uh, do you do any research before you get a decision what to do in that uh, region, that places? It's funny, I, I try not to because I don't believe that art is site-specific. I think that what happens is is we, we are all site-specific wherever we're standing. And I think that when you install something, if it functions in that place, it becomes that site-specific. But I do do a little bit of research. Uh, if I'm going to a region where there's coal, uh, I'll try to find out in my own head if I'm at all interested in coal at that moment. But that's about it. It never relates sociologically and it never relates uh, culturally. Because if the work is totally objective, every culture will essentially relate to it. And it'll look like it, it was made for that and it belongs there. Like any human being that begins to function in any culture, you move them from one place to the other, then when they start to function, they look like they belong there. Well, thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And that's it.